Hello everyone, welcome to Ra Online. So in this session, we are going to learn about men syndromes. What are these men syndromes? Multiple endocrine neoplasias. So these syndromes are going to be characterized by a predilection for tumors involving one or more endocrine glands. That's what makes up this group of diseases. Now, most commonly, most of the men syndromes are going to be familial, although few sporadic reports have been documented. So mostly there is going to be a very strong family history as all of them are autosomal dominant. Now there are four major types of men syndrome. So most of us would already be familiar with men 1 and men 2 which is what we mostly know about. Now men 3 is a part of men 2 and let's say in a sense, men 4 is a part of men 1. We'll understand about them slowly as the session progresses. What are meons? So, multiple endocrine and other organ neoplasias. So, here you have malignancies or not only involving the endocrine glands, you have tumors not only involving the endocrine glands, but you also have tumors involving other non-endocrine organs. This is what constitutes meons. For example, you have the hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome where you have an endocrine problem in the form of parathyroid tumors causing hyperparathyroidism and on the other hand, you have these jaw tumors which are tumors involving a non-endocrine part of the body like the jaw. So, all these syndromes are there. All of them again except McCune Albright are going to be autosomal dominant. McCune Albright alone is caused by mosaicism. So, let's delve a little deeper. Now, how do we ascertain the diagnosis of men? Multiple endocrine neoplasia, as I already mentioned, is nothing but a syndrome of a constellation of tumors involving a lot of endocrine organs. So, this is essentially going to be on one end a clinical diagnosis, on the other end a genetically supported diagnosis because most of them have a strong genetic basis in the form of familial autosomal dominant inheritance. So patients having clinical features of two or more tumors with a strong family history. What does a strong family history mean? There should be at least one first degree relative with at least one tumor consistent or something that's part of the men syndromes. And then genetic, as I said, identification. So from this, we're able to see that there are three major components to the diagnosis of men. One is clinical diagnosis. So there should be consistent clinical features of at least two or more endocrine tumors, which fit into a men syndrome. Then there should be a strong family history which will reflect the autosomal dominant inheritance. So at least one first degree relative with at least one tumor consistent with men. And finally, genetic analysis. So the mutation should be identified in the patient. On this basis, we will be able to diagnose a patient with men syndrome. So clinically, two or more uh, endocrine organs having tumors, strong family history with at least one relative having at least one tumor consistent with men and finally genetic diagnosis. Now having understood this, let's move on to understand the different types of men syndrome. So first let's open up with men 1. Men 1 is also called the Wormer syndrome. So there is going to be a triad of tumors in from head to foot order in the pituitary in the parathyroid and in the pancreas. That's how it works. Now, men 1 has been reported across all ages from 5 years to 80 years. This is seen in patients with a mutation in the menin gene which is found on chromosome 11. Now, men 1 tumors are usually multiple and these tumors have poorer prognosis than when it is isolated. What does that mean? For instance, you have sporadic parathyroid tumors. Now, these sporadic parathyroid tumors may have better prognosis than when associated with MEN1. They're going to be multiple when they're associated with MEN1 as opposed to solitary when they are sporadic. And metastases are going to be more common in tumors associated with MEN1. So, tumors are often larger, aggressive and resistant to treatment whenever they are associated with MEN1. So, M for 
a multiple metastasis and let us say high morbidity which will denote the fact that the tumor is going to be aggressive, resistant to treatment and poor prognosis. So, remember the three M's associated with MEN1 tumors. Multiple metastatic disease more common and highly morbid with respect to the size, the aggressive nature of the tumor and the difficulty in management. Now, the most common feature of MEN1 is going to be primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, as I told you, there are three tumors which make up this syndrome of MEN1. So, pituitary, parathyroid and pancreas. The most common is the parathyroid. So, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is often the most common uh, presenting feature of MEN1. It is also the earliest presenting feature of MEN1. So, what is unique in the primary hyperparathyroidism associated with MEN1 as opposed to a sporadic parathyroid adenoma, let's say. So, here patients often have an early age of onset and uh, there is an equal predisposition between males and females. Whereas, when you look at the sporadic uh, parathyroid uh, adenomas, they are usually solitary and occur slightly later in life and with a female predisposition. Now, that is not the case with the MEN1 associated primary hyperparathyroidism. When we look at the hypercalcemia, in MEN1, M for M, there is only going to be mild hypercalcemia, not a severe hypercalcemia and malignancy is rare. Although if it occurs, metastasis may be common, malignancy is rare. As I said, these tumors are usually going to be either multiple in the parathyroid or instead of adenomas, you may have hyperplasia and treatment is often with surgery. If surgery is not feasible, then calcimimetic agents like sinacalcet may be used. So, with respect to hyperparathyroidism and MEN1, what are the things that we should remember whenever we have a young patient coming with primary hyperparathyroidism but with relatively a mild hypercalcemia and uh, on imaging there is no single adenoma usually all the four glands are hyperplastic or there are adenomas involving all the four or multiple parathyroid glands in that case consider the possibility of underlying MEN1. Now the least common in the triad now Primary hyperparathyroidism is the most common in the triad, right? Now, the least common in the triad is going to be pituitary. Amongst the pituitary tumors, the ones that are more commonly associated with MEN1 are all going to be microadenomas, usually less than 1 cm, and there is going to be a female predisposition. Amongst the hormone secreting pituitary tumors, the most common uh, hormone hypersecretion which is going to be associated with the pituitary tumor in MEN1 is going to be prolactin hypersecretion. Prolactinomas are going to be followed by acromegaly that is going to be followed by Cushing's disease and then you have these non-functioning pituitary tumors. This is in descending order of occurrence the kind of pituitary tumors that are observed in MEN1 starting off with prolactinomas and then you have growth hormone secreting pituitary adenomas, somatotrop adenomas and then you have ACTH producing adenomas and then finally you have non-functioning pituitary adenomas.